This afternoon, if you have a chance, I would encourage you to call some of those who are not here today. Uh, they may be sick, they may be traveling, uh, whatever the reason might be, take a few moments and try and contact them. Also this afternoon, I would encourage you to read Psalm 33, as that's the psalm we plan on uh, looking at tonight in our Sunday evening sermon, Psalm 33. This morning's lesson was a requested lesson, and I'm very glad it was requested because it certainly has some very relevant lessons for you and I today. And, and something I want us to take from this lesson, when it's done, I want us to, to have a little clearer understanding of God's nature and character. Because the lesson reveals to us, in just a few verses, some things that God hates. In particular, it talks about seven things that God hates. So, if God hates these things, they must be very despicable and wicked in His eyes. So, therefore, they would be seven things that you and I would want to avoid at all costs. Our text this morning, you may already know where it's found, is found in Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6, and we'll begin reading... In verse 16, the text goes through verse 19. So our text again, Proverbs chapter 6, beginning in verse 16 and going through verse 19. These all describe opposites of God. They're opposites of God. Verse 16 of Proverbs 6 says this, These six things the Lord hates, yes, seven are an abomination to Him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord, who sows discord among brethren. And this morning, as we look at those seven things, we are going to see that they are characteristics that are completely opposed to God and His nature. Completely opposite of who He is and what He is. And therefore, they are things that you and I must stay away from, must avoid, must do all in our power to never be charged with doing. So let's look at these seven things. He begins by saying, one thing that God hates is a proud look. Someone who's conceited. Someone who is arrogant. Someone who believes that they are better than others. Uh, they're haughty. They have contempt for other people. They think they know more than they really do. These are people who maybe exalt their knowledge above others and claim that, that other people uh, don't know enough to even talk. Uh, I remember one time hearing about a... Unfortunately, this was a gospel preacher. And uh, someone was talking to him about some particular question and he responded, well, do you have a Ph.D. in... Bible or religion or something to do with that? The guy said, no. I said, well, I'm not even going to talk to you then. That's a true story. He was so proud and arrogant that he didn't think anybody was really worthy to talk to him. He was just that much smarter than anyone else. And how sad that is. See, that's, that's the type of thing that God is talking about here. A proud look. We know there's some people in the Bible that had this type of characteristic. First of all, let's look at Luke chapter 18. Sometimes it's best to look at examples. And that's what we want to do. Luke 18, verse 9. Here's a man that fits the description of a proud look as well as any in the Bible. Luke chapter 18, verse 9. These are the words of Christ. 
Verse 9 says, Luke 18, Also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. There's an example of someone who has a proud look. See, he looked at this tax collector and said, I am so much better than he is. I know so much more. I do so much more. I'm just a more religious, spiritual person. And what was wrong? He was completely wrong. And how sad. You can just see his arrogant look. His look of, look how much better I am than you. No wonder God hates that. No wonder it says that God hates a proud look. The Bible says that pride goes before destruction. How many people, whether it's someone well-known, you know, nationally, or, or, or someone you may know yourself who, who fits into that category? Their pride and their arrogance and, and their contempt and haughtiness for others led them to destruction. Because that's what the Bible says. It leads to destruction. A proud look, a haughty look leads to destruction. The second thing he says God hates is a lying tongue. A lying tongue. The word lying here has the idea of deception. Uh, someone who misleads someone else who tries to get them to believe it's something that's not true. This person may take some of the truth and twist it. In other words, it takes something that, that, that is somewhat true and uses it, manipul manipulates it, abuses it, perverts it, twists it, to try and, and mislead someone into believing something that's not true. Turn a few pages over to your Bible to Proverbs chapter 12 and read with me verse 22. Proverbs 12 verse 22. Verse 22 says, Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who deal truthfully are His delight. Did you get that second part? God is delighted when we deal truthfully with people, when we deal honestly with people, when we don't try to deceive them or, or mislead them, when we don't abuse the truth or, or try and twist it. God's delighted in us. Proverbs 26 Verse 28, Proverbs chapter 26, verse 28. A lying tongue hates those who are crushed by it, and a flattering mouth works ruin. The Bible says so much about being honest and, and being truthful. A lying tongue is like poison. The Bible says it's like poison. It causes harm. And sometimes that harm cannot be undone. You know, once we say something, sometimes there's no way of taking it back. Which again, makes it even sadder. In Psalms 101, let's go back a few pages in your Bible. Psalms 101, and we'll read verse 7. Then we're going to go to the New Testament because this is also something the New Testament deals a lot with. Psalms 101, verse 7. Psalms 101, verse 7. 
He who works deceit shall not dwell within my house. He who tells lies shall not continue in my presence. Now, how sad is that? Remember in the book of Revelation, we're, we're toward the end. It's, verse, it's chapter 21, uh, almost the very end of the Bible. And it, says, and it gives a list, it's either in verse 7 or 8, of those who will be in the lake of fire. And there's some pretty despicable, disgusting types of people listed there. But you know what one of the types of peoples are? Liars. Liars. A few years ago, there was a book written called The Day America Told the Truth. And here's just three simple statistics from that book. There were a lot of others that, that we could talk about. But just listen to these. This was a fairly large segment of people that were polled. 91% said they lied routinely about why they considered small matters. Now, that was not just every once in a while, but routinely, commonly, regularly, 91%. 36% lied routinely about what they considered important matters. You know, one in every three people lied routinely, again, not just occasionally, but on a regular basis, they would lie about things they considered important. 69%, over two-thirds of all the people polled, lied regularly, routinely, commonly to their spouse. The day America told the truth. Wow, those are, that's pretty staggering. No wonder God hates a lying tongue because He knows how it can destroy. A lying tongue destroys. And the Bible said God hates a lying tongue. The third thing the Bible says He hates are hands that shed innocent blood. In Psalm 127, verse 3, listen to what is said there. Psalm 127, verse Three. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Why do you think I wrote that verse now? Yeah, you know I'm talking about abortion, right? Hands that shed innocent blood. I would not want to be on judgment day being one of those doctors that commonly, daily did abortion. Because the Bible says God hates people who do that. And if God hates you, you're in the worst possible condition imaginable. But that's what it said, hands that shed innocent blood. And there's certainly nobody... Uh, more innocent than an unborn child. I mean, that's the most innocent you could ever imagine. So people who take that blood, God hates. Why is it so severe? Well, because, number one, God people are made in the image of God. And so are those unborn children. The Bible doesn't refer to them as fetuses, by the way. The Bible talks about and uses the same word for unborn children as, as it does for babies. Interesting, isn't it? The same word, the same concept. Eighteen days after conception, the heart beats on its own. Brain waves are present at eight weeks. The child begins to grab things. At twelve weeks, it cries, sucks its thumb, and so forth. And you can have a whole list of, of those, and those are obviously are, are somewhat approximate, but that's the, that's the typical average things, ages, times. And how sad that people find that okay to take those lives. And again, no wonder God hates people who do that. 
And the Bible does say that, that God hates certain people. He, they, the Bible uses that expression. And we certainly would not want to be one of those who do that. But let's don't just blame the doctors that do that. Let's hold the politicians just as guilty who have enacted those laws that make it legal. They're just as guilty as the doctors are. So God hates those people as well. God hates those people who allow blood, innocent blood, to be shed. So he hates those things. Now, now that is very, very serious. I know the world doesn't even hardly think twice about abortion nowadays, but God thinks twice about it. And he thinks about it a lot. You can see from the Bible. Well, number four, it says... God hates a heart that devises wicked plans or schemes. Usually the heart refers to, and especially in this case, the will. The mind that's coming up with, uh, with thinking about evil things. It plots evil, plots things that are wicked, immoral, unjust. So people who plan and think about and scheme and devise evil and wicked and, and immoral things, it says God hates. Now, God has given us a free will. He allows us to do those things. In Proverbs chapter 15, just a few pages on over, we read verse 26. <clears throat> and we see the contrast in God's mind between these two extremes. Proverbs 15, verse 26. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, something he hates. But the words of the pure are pleasant. So those people, again, who are thinking and devising and planning and scheming to do evil things, wicked things, immoral things, unjust things, they're an abomination to God. No wonder God hates hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes. It says he also hates feet that are swift in running to evil. There's the idea of people who are enthused about doing things that are evil. They're involved in it. They're not concerned about causing harm. They're not concerned about doing things that are wicked. Turn with me to Isaiah 59 for a moment. Isaiah 59, verse 7. Here Isaiah describes some similar people doing similar things. Isaiah 59, verse 7. It says, Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity, wasting and destruction are in their paths. These are people who help others to be wicked. And they're glad that people are immoral. They're glad that people do evil. They're glad that people cause harm. In other words, that's what they want. And so they're involved in those type of activities. And no wonder the Bible says God hates that. Back in Proverbs chapter 4, notice verse 16. Describes kind of another aspect of these people. Proverbs 4 verse 16. It says, For they do not sleep unless they've done evil, and their sleep is taken away unless they make someone fall. In other words, they're only happy when evil is going on, when immorality is going on, when wickedness is going on. That's what makes them happy. No wonder God hates people who do that. Hates feet that are quick to rush into evil. The true child of God never rejoices in evil. Never rejoices in evil. Number six, God hates a false witness who speaks lies. Remember in the Old Testament, there had to be at least two or more witnesses before someone could be accused. 
That's not true today. Boy, people accuse each other and say all kinds of things about each other freely. I know many of you uh, are involved in social networking. But when you read Facebook accounts, boy, that goes on constantly. People accuse and, and say all kinds of horrible things about one another as if putting it on Facebook makes it okay. I didn't say it to their face, so that's all right. I just typed it in, and that's fine. I can say anything I want. Not so. God says he hates those who do this. And you know, if you've ever, someone has ever spread a rumor about you or a false report about you or whatever, you know what he's talking about here. And a lot of times that harm can't be undone. And how sad it is. Happened in Jesus' life, didn't it? Many times people spread rumors about him and false reports. You know, some spread, said, spread the rumor that he was uh, trying to take over the government and he wanted to be a king on earth. Of course, that wasn't true. And so even the Savior had false reports said about him. So no wonder, again, the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, there were severe penalties for people who did that, for being a false witness. There were severe penalties for it. Well, there's severe penalties in today as well. And that's everlasting destruction for people who do that very thing. And then lastly, it says, and one who sows discord or dissension, another word, among brethren. These are contentious people. These are people who intentionally, I mean, that's their goal, is they just want to cause discord and, and, and disharmony and dissension. They don't, want to they don't want people to be in harmony. And a lot of times this is done by practicing number six, tail-bearing. That's a lot of the ways it's done. People spread false rumors about others to cause discord and dissension and disunity. And that's how sometimes it's done. Now, he's, talk he's not talking about uh, those people who are who are standing for what's right. He's talking about people who intentionally cause dissension and discord. He, he, these are people who want problems, who want there to be trouble. And they don't want peace. No wonder it says God hates those who do this, who stir up dissension. And probably by being tail-bearers and spreading false rumors and lying and being deceitful and practicing some of those first six things. Just about any of those things can cause disharmony in the congregation. And how, again, sad that is. Seven things that God hates. Seven things that He finds are abominable. He finds contemptible. And yet sometimes these are found within the body of Christ and how awful that is. Our goal, remember from the beginning, is to look at these seven things and see how they are totally opposite of God's nature and His character. And since it's our goal to try and become more like Him each day, then these are things we certainly want to stay as far away from as possible. We want to make sure that whenever we say something, it's the truth. That we don't spread false rumors. We don't slander people. That we don't try to deceive people. But that we do our very, very best to make sure we tell what's true. And not lie, not bear false witness. And especially not to do that to cause discord or 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 try and take away peace. 
And let us never rejoice in things that are evil. Let us, let us rejoice in things that are good and honorable. And think about those things. I hope you've been thinking about your life because like we talked about in class today, we're to examine ourselves to see whether we're in the faith. See those areas that we need to personally work on. That should be our goal. And this morning, maybe it's, uh, it's the morning that you've decided to uh, come and uh, experience the new birth and have your sins washed away. Or maybe it's the morning that you've realized that you... You have sinned, and you need to ask for the prayers of the congregation. But whatever the, the reason might be, we encourage you to make that decision and come this morning as we stand and sing.